and tell you how many people are going to want to run. Um, so I, uh, I'm a lecturer in computer studies at Berkeley, and I specialize, uh, or I'm working on a research project on Ukrainian theater, um, which is, I guess, one of the motivating factors of uh, the CPA for me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working on um, editing an anthology of Ukrainian plays and translation that will be plays that were written between 2014 and 2022, and it will be coming out with Bloomsbury next year, um, 2023. <laughs> and uh, tonight I'll be reading a play called Skin Deep that's written by um, Natal Kovlov. She's a playwright who was, uh, was originally from Kherson. It was written in 2017, um, which is relevant for, for several reasons, as you'll discover in the text. Um, first, of course, uh, it was written before the full-scale invasion, but also notably that it was written before the COVID pandemic. Um, the text was translated by Karen Kamalski, and um, I'll leave that there for now. Um, this is Alyssa Kramchuk. Alyssa Kramchuk is an author, historian, and the director of Ukrainian Institute of London. Um, tonight, she'll be reading from her book, A Loss, The Story of a Dead Soldier Told by His Sister, which was published by Ibadan in 2021. <laughs> Years are escaping me. Um, and actually, we'll be coming out in a new edition with new material on the 1st of September on um, the uh, Well, this will be reading from her own book, and, uh, and I'll move her to discuss more details. Um, and next, we'll hear from Maria Montague. Maria Montague is Deputy Director of Ukrainian Institute of London. She's a, a cultural manager who specializes on Ukraine, and she's also a theater director um, and a translator. And her project, um, which was the first, the English language premiere of Google Bush's play, Maglana, was um, premiered in the UK and uh, was funded by Arts Council in 2018. Um, Maria will be reading three poems by Ukrainian poet Irina Shubalova in translation by Elena Blacker. And what we're going to do is we'll each read, um, we'll each share with you these excerpts or these readings that we've chosen. And then we'll take, uh, after we've heard uh, all three readings, we'll take a few moments each to reflect on why we chose these readings and how they connect to um, our work and what they mean to us in the context of um, the current circumstances. And after a brief discussion between the three of us, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So, um, with that, then I think I'll get started with uh, Nathal Kublok, Skin Deep, translated by Karen Kamalski. My son brought a slip of paper home from school today and asked me to fill it in. It had two entries, one for my signature and one for my name. I, first name, last name, have examined my child and didn't find anything suspicious on his or her body. I asked my son what I was supposed to find and he shrugged. Then the same slip of paper was brought back from school by my two younger daughters. They said that teachers were afraid of an epidemic and that the history teacher called in sick. My son added that he hopes she won't get better until the end of the school year, <laughs> but that actually she's pregnant and gone for good on maternity leave. All kinds of things seem to be constantly happening to this history teacher. First, she and her mom came here from some kind of war zone city. I mean, she came first, and her mom came later, because the mom couldn't leave her apartment, you know, the usual. She decided to leave only when everything was bombed to a halt and she discovered that she was the only one left in her building. But by then it was too late to leave, and it turned out that those who evacuate people from war zones charge money for it. Getting the mom out of there required paying for it. So this teacher announced to the school about her trying to raise some money. A fair of sorts was arranged. The money was collected, and the teacher's mom was evacuated, together with her two dogs, two cats, and her favorite hookah. And she kept telling the kids about it, instead of teaching history. My daughters told me that veterans came in to talk to the children about war. And then the teacher took the lead, started describing what kind of apartment she used to have, and what kind of car she used to have, and what kind of... And then she declared that history no longer exists as a subject. 
because history is rewritten every five years and whatever she's been teaching is bullshit and that she wants to go back and keep on breeding Italian greyhounds. So it seems to me the school's only keeping her for pity's sake. Nothing surprising about her getting sick. I told my daughters to undress. I asked them, what is it I should be looking for? Lice? I read that when a war goes on for a long time, you can get lice. It's stress related. They usually live under the hairy layer of the head. And when a person's really stressed, the skin on her head gets thin. And the lice find their way out. And that's it, they just come out. But if you put medications on your head, they go right back in. Otherwise, they just drop dead. And bed bugs. Another token of war times. Thank God we've got no bed bugs. Never have them. Even when we left, even with all those trains, we've never seen any bed bugs. As for lice, I only had them once, in my childhood. And back then, everyone who went to pioneer summer camps got lice. That happened because the kids were taken from their homes, so they were under a lot of stress. Bed bugs are a Russian thing, actually. In our country, I haven't seen a single bed bug. But I remember this time I went to Moscow, and I stayed at a hotel. I turned the mattress upside down. And I saw a bunch of them. I grabbed my bag, ran straight to my friend's house, let them keep their stinking hotel to themselves. We ended up pouring boiled water all over the bag because of the bed bugs. So I searched the kids for lights. Their hair was clean. I looked at their skin. It had goosebumps. My girls were freezing. I felt so sorry for them, and I told them to hurry and get their clothes back on. On their paper, I wrote that they'd been examined and that they're fine. I wrote the same on my son's of the paper. Then I went on Facebook to learn what this new epidemic was all about. Facebook was low-key, everyday feed, same old stuff. Another grant for immigrants, another round of good people collecting money for tactical blogs, another theater show about the war, and an East Express festival in the liberated territories. Meanwhile, the theater director is writing about transgender people, so nothing whatsoever about the epidemic. There was a funny news piece about a city on the other side whose mayor, a fake one, of course, discusses current events with an Italian investor. Full disclosure, the investor is yet another fake. He came here as a contract soldier in the beginning of the war, and now he's just sitting there pretending to be an investor. It's hilarious, obviously. Who would invest in a war zone? I like the photo of this pseudo-investor. It's kind of weird. He was sitting there in his underwear, holding a machine gun, covered in tattoos head to toe, like an image from a porn movie. I mean, I don't watch porn that often. <laughs> but there's a lot of macho guys like him in those films. Oh well, nothing about the epidemic on Facebook. I took a picture of the paper slips brought by my kids and I posted it. Maybe somebody knows something. In the evening, I took a bath. I've got a big mirror in my bathroom. And I usually look at it as I get undressed. I admire myself, because I don't see myself naked that often. Not really. I looked really pretty in the mirror. Not the same as when I was 16, but still. Uh, breasts, my breasts are not the same. Nipples aren't as spiky as they used to be. Belly's no longer flat. But I've still got a more than desirable waist to hip ratio. <laughs> then I notice a yellowish bruise on my hip. I rubbed it and thought, I must have bumped into the corner of the table. I put YouTube on, and I started doing asanas just like the two Australian girls taught me. Then I went to the store and I bought some hand cream, meat, bread, milk, and cabbage. I decided to send my son to get the potatoes once he's back from school. The bruise on my hip was strangely aching. I bought an anti-bruise balm at the pharmacy and I started rubbing it into the spot. Then there was another spot spreading out right next to the first one, a greenish spot. I really can't recall when I could have gotten it. Maybe in the morning when I was still drowsy? The kids came back from school and said that their afternoon lessons were canceled. The school, school was on quarantine because of the epidemic. They didn't know what kind of epidemic it was, but my son said, it must be something very contagious, so he doesn't plan on leaving the house and intends to spend the entire epidemic online. The girls went to the kitchen to make some food. Suddenly, 
my neighbor called me on the phone, a neighbor from the other house, from the zone. She told me my ex was complaining to everyone, saying what a bitch I am for tricking the kids and taking them out of there secretly. If not for that, he joined the home guard with our son, and now he's alone and sick, and the home guard won't take him because he's too old. Well, he's been repeating that refrain for three years already. Nothing new. The neighbor from my former life said that it was actually quite all right. The shootings are far away. They're not aiming at them. They're aiming away from them. At us, probably. And they get some humanitarian aid, and life is livable. There's mobile communication, and the retirement pensions are being paid. She asked me to take out her Ukrainian pension with the card she gave me, and when I left, when I left and hand the money to her sister, I asked her not to give out my number and my whereabouts to my ex. Well, actually, they don't really know where I am. Since when we left, I didn't know it myself. I hardly even had any things with me other than IDs, money, several year savings, kids' clothes, and my laptop. My son didn't even want to leave, by the way. He believed it when his daddy kept going on about Ukraine being evil and about how we should hold on to Russia because their salaries are higher. We hardly even knew Ukrainian. So that was when we learned it, I mean, school years in Ukrainian. I asked the neighbor if they have an epidemic. She said that they've got other things to worry about. They've hardly got any limits of medicine in the pharmacies, and that's why all of them are healthy. <laughs> I decided to watch some TV. The same old series were on, as well as some talk shows about how to lose weight and how to make food. In the news, they were showing how many Ukrainians were killed in the war, how many were wounded, something about protests in Russia, something about an airplane, something about new anti-abortion laws, about gas prices rising, and about the promises of a visa-free regime. In a nutshell, everything was calm. Everything was its good old self. In the very end, they mentioned Ukrainian schools closing for quarantine, but they didn't say why. I figured it was just another seasonal flu. My Facebook friends didn't seem to know anything. They were outraged by the medical notes in the school. One guy wrote that his kids are also at home. The bruise on my hip hurt, and another one appeared right next to it, the brown colored one. I took a picture of my leg with my phone, and I put it into Google search by image. Google came up with tanks, soldiers wearing uniforms, and stuff like that. In the morning, the pain in my leg grew stronger, and I went to a local day room. I wasn't sure who I should go to, a dermatologist, a surgeon, a hematologist. So I signed up to see a primary care specialist. There were quite a few people in line. So I started scrolling my Facebook feed while absent minded and rubbing my leg. Someone commented about my post about the school note, saying that it was a virus and that it was called CCS. I didn't know what it meant. I tend to think they, think they come up with those viruses every year just to sell more pills and vaccines. The doctor examined me, listened to my lungs, looked in my throat, took my blood pressure. When she examined the bruises on my leg, she wore gloves. And then she asked me to sit and told me I have CCS. I asked, what the hell is CCS? I don't even have a cough. If I have bruises on my leg, there must be something wrong with my blood. But the doctor started writing lengthy paragraphs in the health record. And then she looked up at me and said that CCS means camouflage colored skin. I'm in a constant stress because of the war. So my skin turns camouflage. This is an epidemic and it's highly contagious. So I should be admitted to the hospital. I didn't get anything. I was sitting there looking at her as if she were bonkers. Camouflage? War? We ran, we ran away from the war three years ago. We left it behind us. The war is over there. And even over there, it's not all over the place. So why should I be stressed? I signed a waiver from hospitalization. If I go to the hospital, who's going to take care of the kids? And I kind of thought it was silly to lie in the hospital because of three spots on your leg. And I thought everything she told me was just, just as silly. How can a war become a virus that shows through your skin and hurts? 
War is out there, in the East. It's a business. It's death. It's sweat and blood. But the kids and I are over here, and we're safe. When I got home, I checked Facebook for news. One of my friends wrote that Sergei Berlakov died at the front line exactly one year ago, and that today is his death anniversary. I believe it's a guy I used to know. We went to the same school. I even had a crush on him. He was hot. Then many years later, we found each other on Facebook, and it turns out that he's got two kids and a good life, and I didn't want it to be him. So I scrolled my feet down as fast as possible. The pain in my leg grew even stronger. Another spot started showing. This time it was sand color. I googled how to cure camouflage colored skin. Only a few articles matched the inquiry, but it seemed like it really was an epidemic, and that the Ministry of Health recommends rest, rest, and rest again. I thought, yeah, right, no rest for the wicked. Well, the kids are quarantined. I've got to do spring cleaning. I've got to buy shoes for my youngest daughter. I've got to take my son to the dentist, get his tooth filled. I wrote a new Facebook post about finding out stuff about the CCS epidemic. But I thought it best to skip writing that I was diagnosed with it, just in case. Within a week, everyone was talking about CCS. Facebook was boiling over. Stars gave interviews on every possible TV talk show. The politicians said the same old things about doing everything possible and assured us scientists were already working on a vaccine. I was examining the children for spots every day, including the oldest one. The kids were healthy. My condition, however, was only getting worse. The spot was growing larger, spread up to my knee. It looked like a camouflage pattern trouser and it ate. I kept putting anti-bruise lotion on it, but it wasn't helping. I kept on thinking, why did I get sick? Was it because I'm a former military woman? But I did my service at the border during peaceful times, and it mainly involved dog training. I did run away from war, yes, but I've hardly even seen it. I mean, we weren't even really bombed. The small town next to us was bombed, but not ours. How to cure camouflage colored skin. Advice kept coming from all directions. I was advised to drink uh, blood purifying herbs, to take calming baths, to get massages, to listen to classical music, to meditate, to leave for another war deprived country, to put lotions on my spots, to enjoy pretty views, to watch comedies, and to have regular intake of vitamin C. In another week of flash mob, Hashtag how to cure war went viral on social media. People posted pictures of their spots, and it turned out almost everyone I know had CCS. I took a picture of my leg too. The spot reached my ankle, and it hurt badly. I kept taking painkillers before going to bed. They made the pain number, and then I could get some sleep. The kids felt really sorry for me. My daughter kept asking whether I was dying, and I didn't know the answer. Nobody in the entire world knew the answer to this question. How does the epidemic end? That evening, we all gathered together to watch the news, which was still pretty casual. The first channel covered the fighting, the story of a successful businessman who came from over there and built a business in Kiev, the epidemic. They talked about the flash mob. Hashtag how to cure war. And then my youngest, Olechka, jumped up and she screamed at the top of her lungs, what do you mean how? You cure war with peace. I couldn't fall asleep until dawn. I kept thinking about her words. It does really make sense. The only way to cure war is with peace. If war is the reason for the disease, then you need to cure the war, because camouflage colored skin is just a symptom. But how? My son said that we should kill Putin. <laughs> That's a good idea, no doubt. But how would we kill him? Especially since there are rumors about him having many doubles, and other ones about him being dead for quite a while. So how would that be helpful? 
In the morning, the kids and I decided that I simply need to stop listening to anything about the war, or reading anything about the war, and that I shouldn't even be talking or thinking about the war. But then on the other hand, do I even think about it? I mean, I think about what I should do to make the pain in my leg go away, or about what I should make for breakfast, about still not being done with spring cleaning, about my son getting his passport but not yet showing up at the military recruiting station even though he's about to turn 17, and about the fact that if the war isn't over by the time he turns 18, he would be forced to go there. But stop. Here. Here you go. I just thought about the war. But of course, thoughts are material. They tend to attract the object of the thought. All right, that's why you need to switch over and think about something pleasant, a meditation, something that fills my soul with peace. OK, so what's in there now? War? God, yes, why does it have to be so hard? I turned to Facebook, hoping to distract myself. The flash mob wave subsided. People needed to post something other than their camouflage colored bodies. Stuff like kittens and memes and funny videos. Especially since doctors recommended laughing. I decided to monitor my feed thoroughly for the people who can remind me that my country's at war and make their posts invisible to me. Okay, here's a friend writing about making an eco-settlement. Nothing about war. Oh no, right below she writes that the purpose of the settlement is rehabilitation for fighters and veterans. All right, let's get rid of her posts. Next, my ex-boyfriend's wife posts a cake recipe. That's not about war, is it? But they ran away with the kids from over there, from a captured city. And I can't help remembering that when I read whatever it is that they post. So let's remove them from my zone of attention as well. Ah, here. Here are my feminist friends posting about domestic violence. Well, I can leave that. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> because next they write about military people's post-traumatic stress syndrome, which increases violence. Damn. All right, now what? Ah, a good post about coffee. Um, the guy who made it used to post pictures from coffee from the war zone for a year. And his wife used to post pictures of their kids waiting for dad. It's not really about the war, or is it? Let's remove him to be on the safe side. Okay, so all journalists need to go. That's a guarantee of daily news about war disease, et cetera. Same goes for politicians. So who do I have left? Hmm, friends from Russia. <laughs> well, they also fall into disgrace. I mean, the war is with Russia. Oh, artsy people. The artsy people are still there. Exhibitions, films. Uh, wait a second. When you look closely at their posts, it turns out the films are about the war. The exhibitions and the theater shows are also about the war. How come we never noticed that? Everything is soaked, poisoned with war. The posts that are seemingly about other stuff, they're, they're all still about war. It is war that is showing through the spots. It wore into my body. After Facebook was cleansed, it became boring came down to wax hair removal and anti-wrinkle cream commercials. I changed my status to, you can cure war with peace, and I turned my computer off. Well, I guess there's no point in turning the TV on, that's for sure. I could also disconnect my phone. I could send the kids to buy groceries, since the streets are full of billboards that summon people to enlist in the army to help the army. On the street, you meet people in uniform or acquaintances who moved here from over there, etc. Weirdly enough, to this day, I've never realized that war has surrounded me all over. At first, being left without sources of information felt weird. No internet, no TV, no phone calls. My friends called my children's phones. They've answered that mom's doing well, she's busy. From time to time, they read about CCS. And they told me that the epidemic was still going strong, but that there were neither fatalities nor remedies. The kids took money off my card, bought groceries and other necessities, went to the pharmacy to get painkillers. And then I realized 
that they suddenly become adults. They got used to examining themselves every day and joked about developing immunity to war. In a couple of months, it was spring. Camouflage colored spots covered the entire left half of my body and reached my face. Informational imprisonment did not bring any results, so I decided to go outside. I wore clothes that properly covered my body. I put concealer on my face, and I went to the closest mini park. I sat on the bench and smoked. I looked at the sky, the trees, and finally, I did not think about anything. I just felt happy looking at the sun, the wind, the blue skies, grass shoes. I looked at the ground next to the bench, and I noticed a bunch of red soldier bugs. That's the nickname for those bugs. There were lots of them. They were crawling one after another, sometimes coming together in small groups, always in motion. I grabbed my phone and took a picture of them. I posted it on Facebook for the first time in months, and I wrote, spring does not cure. There were tears streaming down my face. I was, I was sitting there crying till dusk, making an effort to recall the actual name of those bugs. Little red soldier bugs, you know, red with black dots. They were crawling under the bench, and they sometimes crawled up my shoes. At home, Wikipedia revealed to me that those were actually bed bugs. The red soldier bug, or the Pyracosaurus apteris, or firebug, is a common insect of the family Pyracoridae, 9 to 11 millimeters in size. In early spring and in the end of summer, firebugs can often be found in groups near the base of lime tree trunks, always on the sunny side. Then the war ended. Politicians came to an agreement. America put pressure on Russia. The sanctions worked. Crimea was returned to Ukraine. The army troops left Donbass, taking Russian world lovers along, and everything seemed to be good again. The kids went back to school. My spots started coming off. The same was happening to other people. For an entire year, we were rejoicing peace and the end of the epidemic. We even celebrated Victory Day on July 18th. I was mostly off painkillers. My face and my body cleared up. And I was posting on Facebook again. One year later, I decided to go back home to Donetsk region. At first it was just about taking a look at how it was, while well, settling back there with the kids was in the long-term plans. We took the bus and we came out of the bus station. We went up the painfully familiar dusty road, took a turn by the old line train, and from afar, we saw our house was no longer standing. Only ruins were left. We walked in the ruins, and once in a while, the kids found things that they recognized. I sat on a bench that miraculously remained intact. It was made by my husband back in the days when things were so good between us. I wanted to smoke so bad. I thought that my husband probably left with the home guard and that he might have blown the house up himself just out of spite. <laughs> I thought we could still rebuild it. It's our land after all, and the flowers I once planted are still growing around the house. And suddenly I felt a sharp but familiar pain a couple of camouflage colored spots showed on my arm. As it turned out later, I wasn't the only person to get the spots back. The doctor said that war, once it inhabits a person, never truly disappears. You can only diminish its damage by enjoying life and trying not to recollect the past. But those of us who have been through war know it only for the spots to reappear. And this time it's forever.
mom. My back was really sore. The midwife was rubbing it to ease the pain and asked me, do you want a boy or a girl? We didn't have any ways of telling him his gender in those days. I said, a boy. She looked at me surprised. I said, girls' lives are so much harder. How wrong I was. My mother wasn't wrong. She gave birth to a boy when she was barely out of her teenage years herself. His life didn't turn out to be easy, but it wasn't as hard as hers. Suffice it to say, few things can be harder than burying your own child, your first one. I like to ask her sometimes what it was like before my other brother and I came along, when it was just her and him. This woman that so often looks to me like she is made of iron tells me stories that melt my heart. Perhaps when she was 21 and he was a baby, she wasn't made of iron. Or maybe that iron core was always there, otherwise she would have broken long ago. The subsequent years simply tempered the mental base and made what was inside, what kept her together through all that hardship, show a little on the outside. But when she remembers my brother's birth, the early years of his life, the armor that she grew to defend herself against everything that life threw her way, falls away. Her face lights up, her eyes fill up with warmth, her voice softens. I loved holding him next to my face, so close that I could feel his skin against my cheek, so near that I could smell his hair. I wanted to hear him breathe. I looked at him and I couldn't believe that he was real. I couldn't believe that he was mine. She lifts her tired, wrinkly fingers to her face to show how close she held the baby. Her face beams with a smile, so beautiful. She can see that child from my youth so clearly that I can almost see him too, reflected in her eyes. I ask her why she thinks she loved me so. She says she doesn't know. I feel like I need to provide an answer to fill the, fill the awkward silence. So I make a suggestion. Perhaps it's because you finally had something and someone of your own. You've never had anything that belonged only to you before he came along. As soon as it comes out of my mouth, I feel stupid. I had added difficult memories to memories that seem so sweet, so precious. She says, perhaps. I haven't ruined the magic of that. She's still looking somewhere beyond me. She can still feel the soft skin against the cheek, only the memory, a memory that is 45 years old today. This is the third birthday that we must celebrate without the birthday boy, already two and a half years after his death. When he was alive, we didn't meet up on his birthday. We all lived far away from each other. We would maybe text one another asking if we had been in Dutch, and if it returned to anyone's texts. On one birthday, after he joined the army, I was the lucky one who worked through to him on the phone. We had a really nice chat. I put the phone down and called my other brother immediately, urging him to call the water. Because he had a good reception on his phone, he hadn't had a drink, and he was in the chat with him. <laughs> this presented a rare chance to have a conversation uninterrupted by the failure of technology or the news. You let them as I suggested. We were both pleased. We managed to talk to our eldest sibling, and for once, it felt like a real birthday. After the boy's death, his birthdays become a reason for us to meet as a man. To sit and remember together. To try and focus on good things. Funny things. To bring up difficult memories carefully. Once, my other brother remembered that when he was little, one of the general secretaries died in the USSR. He couldn't remember which one. There was a period when they were dying one after <laughs> And Swan Lake was playing on the TV on a loop. Whenever there was an emergency in the Soviet Union, for some reason they used to put Swan Lake on the TV to fill the airways. The flags were lowered in the streets, everyone was in so mood, and Europe was crying because he thought that a war was about to start. 
this in the Soviet kid's head naturally meant that the Germans were going to come and kill everyone. He remembered Volodya calming him and saying, don't worry, we'll go to the countryside, dig a trench and fight them all. You are always got it right. The war started a few days later, only it wasn't against the Germans. I talked about my memory of when both of my brothers teased me about saying Saint Nicholas is my favorite saint because in Ukraine on the 19th of December, in the middle of the night, he brings presents and puts them under your pillow while you're asleep. He comes with an angel and a devil, and if you've not been a good child, the devil leaves a stick for you. I always got a stick. <laughs> a very small, unthreatening one. But I also got lots of presents. The most exciting part was when the three of us would sit and wait for Saint Nicholas's arrival. We pledged not to fall asleep or to wake each other if one of us did. The outcome was always the same. I would wake up in the morning and hear my brothers excitedly sharing stories about seeing the big beard and St. Nicholas, the beautiful angel and the scary devil. They would tell me that I had fallen asleep just before they all arrived and they didn't want to wake me in case I scared away the magical guests. I would cry inconsolably because I had missed the scene I so long to see and because they hadn't woken me up, which amounted to a total betrayal. <laughs> it was only the thought of presence unfailingly waiting under my pillow that was uh, eventually to me up. My father's turn to share a memory game. He said he couldn't think of it. After an awkward silence, he said, all I can remember is this time when I picked him up from the get go. He kept chatting, telling stories, he was so excited. That was a revelation. I never realized that my brother had been a chatty kid, especially with my dad. Are you sure you're talking about all of them? I asked just to make sure that he wasn't confusing him with my other brother. Yes, came the brief and confident answer. I felt that there was more to that memory, but I didn't want to. We all reminisced from Barry. Our new tradition of celebrating Boyer's birthday was still very fragile. It had to be handled with care. The most vivid memories are those that my mother keeps, and I like to listen to them when no one else is around. So the two of us tried to meet before the rest arrived. I pour us some coffee, and she pours her heart out. She too has an intercounting story. I have heard it before when Gloria was alive, but hearing it now is a living experience. I will never forget when I came to pick him up from the getting up, wearing a new dress. I didn't have many dresses and rarely got something new, so he immediately spotted that I looked different. He was not open. Rather than commenting on my dress, he simply said, Oh, I'm so beautiful. So beautiful. I remember it as if it happened. He was always waiting for me to pick him up from the end. And later, I was always waiting for him to come home from somewhere. In the 1990s, when he was a teenager, he was really into horse riding. I waited for him at a tram stop after his training to make sure he got home safely. All the boys could approach you and ask you for a cigarette. If you didn't have one, they could, you could get beaten up. If you did have one, you could still get beaten up. <laughs> I worried and waited. I have my own memories of those turbulent days. Once a boy only a little older than my brother was stabbed in our neighborhood. My brothers knew me well. I was so scared for both of them that I had nightmares of someone chasing them with a ch chasing them with an axe almost every night for about a year. My mother continues her story. That night I waited and waited. The trams came and went, but he was nowhere to be seen. There were no mobile phones in those days, and he didn't have, and we didn't even have a landline then. I couldn't call anyone to see if he was okay. I must have gone through all the worst scenarios in my head. And suddenly he came out of the tram. I was so happy. I said, Florida, where the hell were you? <laughs> he said, Mama, one of our guys fell off a horse. 
we had to walk him home to make sure that he was all right. At first, I was quite cross. They hadn't found a way to tell me that he was going to be delayed. But my anger passed away. I remembered when I had fallen off a horse as a young girl and broken my arm. So I stopped telling him off. My mother was happy that her son was safe. She was proud that he had been busy looking after his friend. My mother pauses before continuing her memories. We drink our coffee. As she follows her son's life, my mother's memories grow heavier with pain. I didn't need to be a bad mother. There was so many experience. When the mother went on a school trip, I prepared everything for him as best I could. But when he came back, he was so upset. He said, I felt so ashamed when all the kids got their flasks out and I had my tea in a bottle when it had, where it had already gone cold. How cool could I have known about these flasks? We never had a thermos flask in our house. I hadn't heard of one until he told me about it. I was so embarrassed about my ignorance. As she was beating herself up, I thought about how cruel children were. I thought how sad it was that a woman who had done everything she could for a child could be so convinced that she had been a bad mother because of a stupid part. I asked her about the birthday party she arranged for Walter when he turned 18. It was in a restaurant with lots of guests. I must have been nine years old, but my memory of it is hazy. All I remember is mom and dad running around trying to organize everything, cakes being delivered to the party dates, straight to the restaurant, and my brother looking all grown up in a smart brand new jacket. I still have a photo of him in that jacket. It looks like a kid who wants to be taken for a nap. My mother doesn't have any memories to share about that last year. Maybe she only remembers the things that she didn't get right. There was always a special bond between my eldest brother and my mother. The love-hate relationship was so powerful. They could say the most painful things to each other, but it was hard he called in the middle of the night to ask her to pray for him. She always prayed for him anyway. She didn't need to be reminded. The last time our family got together was in the chapel at the war before my brother's funeral. The priest had finished the service and left. We had the whole evening to ask I was in hysterics. My other brother looked like he was in denial. He stood on either side of the coffin. My mother stood in the center, directly facing my brother's body. She talked to him as if he was still there, as if he could hear her, but just wasn't responding, much as it often was the case when he was still alive. His lack of response and our unwillingness to interrupt the monologue allowed her to say everything that lay heavy on her chest. She kept talking, arguing, apologizing, and arguing. Eventually, she ran out of things to say or simply tired of speaking when there was no reaction to her words. Still directing her words at my brother's motionless face, she said, and look at you now. We are all here. We've come to you from far away, and you're just lying there like a prince. <laughs> the words were so out of place that we all burst out laughing. The next day, before they closed the coffin, my mother touched my brother's arms and legs as if to check that he was warm. The way you touch your children when you put them to sleep. When she was 21, she wanted a boy because she suspected that the girls' lives were harder. Now in the 60s, she knew it for a fact. Cultural Stratum. Remember how once in a past
past life so long ago you would wake up and casually listen to the news now that seems unbelievable, just like thinking about Bucha or Ipin. You can't picture those parks full of pine trees around sanatoriums and old estates. You see only blown up bridges, gutted houses, streets densely covered in the shards of people's lives. Isn't that what the archaeologists call a cultural stratum? Skin stripped from a living epoch laid out on the earth, a bloody brag. Before this epoch began, we listened absent-mindedly to the news and lived in cities with drama, drama theatres in parks full of pine trees. We were naive and beautiful. We didn't have to get excited about the single cabbage we hunted down in the empty supermarket. We were like children. Brushing our teeth in the morning, we would learn the names of places, Aleppo, Sanaa, Mikella, where the epoch skinned alive lay in convulsions, its skin cast aside, soaking the ground in blood, waiting for future archaeologists. But we would always forget those names. We would finish brushing our teeth, we'd put on our new sneakers and grab a coffee in the kiosk, go down into the metro without having to pick through people's bodies sleeping on the platforms. We were creatures made of a different sort of material, softer and pinker. We would explain to our children what war is, the way you might explain what the South Pole or the planet Mars are, and not like you might explain why you can't stick your fingers in the electric socket or climb on the windowsill when the window is open. We didn't even know in that past life, so long ago, how many steel centimeters of pain can be plunged so easily into our soft pink bodies. All day I walk around keeping your name under my tongue, afraid to say it aloud lest it escape and fly away over the city in which for 20 days now nobody turns on the lights at night. Between the stars and the comets and artillery shells whose trajectories in truth are unknowable, a small bird with a great red voice. A small bird with a bitter seed of sorrow in its beak. But if it were to drop the seed by accident, then even from this mutilated ground, it will grow into a great tree of love. History sleeps and dreams. When my grandmother would tell me about how she, at 18, was an Ostarbeiter in Germany, her stories seemed like dreams. In those dreams, strangers in a strange land brought from afar in cattle trucks like cattle, knitted socks from ropes, hanged themselves in greenhouses on German farms, rode bicycles, fell in love. I think that maybe to her, a 70-year-old when we were talking, it seemed that she had dreamed it all. The cheerful French prisoners of war, the rosy-cheeked girlfriends with lavish curls whom she never saw again after the war, who were later greedily devoured by the always hungry red motherland. And only postcards, with rosy-cheeked bourgeois angels signed for a new serve testified to something. Lead ink into wooden desk drawers. Today, my mother's friend, who just got out of robbery through a humanitarian corridor, tells us about a woman who seasoned a dinner for Russian soldiers with rat poison. The surviving Russians raised ten houses to the ground. About a man who was shot in his own car and remained sitting in it for three days. About how when they ran out of food, People ate nuts and honey, just like St. John the Baptist in the desert. Her stories seem like dreams, a collective nightmare from which we struggle to awake, in the depths of which roam restless empires, devouring their own children as befits such mythical monsters. 
In this dream, as in a thick fog, we stumble around one another. My late grandmother, her curly haired girlfriends, the German farmers, the rosy cheeked, big eyed angels, the man shot dead near Rogori, the woman with the jar of rat poison, the Russian conscripts with bulging eyes and blue tongues, and my mother's friend's nephew, still so very young, killed on Wednesday in the territorial defense. We catch each other with our elbows, exchange unseeing glances, and eat obediently, spoon after spoon, of this thick, bitter darkness. share this text with you, but um, before I do that, I wondered if it might be good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. And if the other one, that one, okay, I'm going to try it. Um, <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned earlier, sorry, it's, hard, it's a bit hard to recover from those um, readings, I think, probably for everybody. This is a text that, as I mentioned earlier, was written in 2017, but I actually hadn't read it until recently. And I suppose one of the reasons that I wanted to share, with it, share it with an English-speaking audience is because I find it so remarkably resonant um, with what what's happening right now um, in terms of a feeling of, of the kind of all-encompassing and inescapable and long-lasting pain and horror of this moment. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons I was particularly interested in the, that, the expression of that experience in this text um, is connected to work that I have previously researched, which has been um, focused primarily on documentary theater. And um, my, I wrote a book about documentary theater in Russia, and more recently I have been um, working on a, a project about, together with a Ukrainian colleague named Elizabeth Alina, I've been working on a project about um, Ukrainian documentary theater as it has developed since 2014. Um, and not only documentary theater, but actually a very specific subgenre of documentary theater known as witness theater, in which people tell their own stories on stage. And uh, part of our research has been an attempt to try to understand why that specific form of performance was so um, resonant and so effective uh, for so many people during those years, and uh, in what ways we might understand the Ukrainian specific form of witness theater as its own kind of anti-colonial resistance um, between 2014 and 2022. And Lisa and I have, has all, have also talked quite extensively about the ways in which we don't see um, witness theater as um, representative of this moment in the way that we have interpreted it that way of pa in, in past moments. And, um, Something that Alyssa and I have spoken about is is the question about you know how can how can we interpret these these events this moment this experience well how how are people interpreting them how are people representing them and what are the right ways to uh, to talk about war to portray this war in this moment and I have been grappling with these questions and. And something that this text, a question that this text um, raises for me is, is about whether or not there might be a way in which the kind of sci-fi and fantasy genre that it plays into um, offers us some insight into 
certain unspeakable or unthinkable or un for many of us, unimaginable events. Um, in some ways, I think for me, it, it helped me uh, working with this text, reading this text, sharing this text, has, has been a way for me to um, find a different kind of connection with some of the things that I personally have found it hard to feel. Um, so that's why, I, that's why I chose this text to share with you. Uh, it's kind of simple for me. I mean, I had a, I had a choice of 20-something chapters from the book, and uh, I knew my mom was coming tonight, so it was my family, so uh, there you go. <laughs> I chose it for that reason, because it's a, it's a privilege to be able to read that sort of personal uh, text and be vulnerable in that way in my family's presence, in my mother's presence. Um, but that's not the only reason, of course. Um, the first version of the text that later became a book was a, a play, a documentary play. We premiered here in the theatre, which was kind of weird to come back a little bit from this, but yeah, it was different uh, to how it is now. Um, and uh, speaking about you know writing, theatre, processing things, I've written new work since to add to the book, the new edition of the Kaiser family when your chairs will have new chapters. But I can't imagine writing something for stage. I can't imagine performing something. I, I, I write because I feel I, I, I always all been saying I have the writing process my experience in witnessing, witnessing, because I'm not witnessing directly. I'm directly like here I'm just witnessing something we'll hopefully talk about it a bit more, witnessing something that other people are witnessing. Um, I need to process it, but I can't imagine performing it or having someone perform it. So maybe that's something we could all discuss together. But I also wanted to read the specific piece because it's not directly about war as such. It's about how wars destroy families' lives, how shattered and grief is, and how it doesn't pass. Uh, I mean, now it's five years, just over five years since my brother's death. But you know, the, our family traditions and our recollections and our pain is still there, and that is the situation in which so many families in Ukraine have found themselves in the last five months. And it's the sort of trauma that will have to be dealt with by generations and generations of Ukrainians to come. And I guess the last thing I wanted to mention is that I really wanted to, as all of us, I guess, consciously or not, to talk about women's experiences of this form. Civilian experience, which can be lost a little bit uh, in all of the stories of battlefields, tanks, and trenches, um, but I think which we absolutely have to discuss. Um, Maybe just picking up on uh, what Alessia mentioned about uh, this experience of witnessing, witnessing. Um, I actually find it very therapeutic spending some time with these poems um, and this experience of us being in London where we are so far away from, uh, from what's happening in Ukraine. And like Irina captures so powerfully especially in the History Speaks and Dreams poem, how stories and reality just feel like they're blurred and stories like people feeding rat poison to Russian soldiers and eating nuts and honey to stay alive aren't fairy tales but are real. And, uh, and for us here, even more so, um, uh, Actually, I'm not Ukrainian, I'm British, I'm very connected to Ukraine, but I, I'm still at such a distance, even though this touched me way more than you know, anything ever in the past. Um, but still trying to process that reality sometimes is really difficult, and I increasingly, um, over the past months, feel that that's something that I find harder and harder to process and um, stay connected to, and, uh, I, and, and to just fully take in 
or just feeling like there's this dual reality of going on of kind of living normal life and then speaking with somebody who's in Ukraine and then being reminded of what the, what is really happening there and trying to find a way to navigate that. And um, I, I really found that very powerful in Alina's poetry. Unless I was just speaking earlier about the fact that Alina herself wrote these poems from China where she's based, but very recently. So she's kind of also got the lens of um, having loved ones in Ukraine, uh, but not being there and the different kind of pain that that uh, involves. Um, and then I, I, I uh, actually wanted to read another tiny, tiny extract from a documentary play that um, I co-created a few years ago um, after the war started in 2014. And together with Bogdan Tomarski, we uh, gathered testimonies from Ukrainian activists and soldiers and people who had been displaced from Crimea and uh, Donbass. And uh, one of the amazing people that we interviewed, um, Larissa, also touches on this sense of absurdity of how quickly war can disrupt the lives that we um, take so much for granted, which really echoed for me, um, especially the first poem that I read, um, uh, 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 this kind of sense of absurdity. I'm just going to read this as well now. So this is in Larissa's words, uh, and we interviewed her in 2015. And she, she said, I was thinking of the summer of 2013 the other day, I remember it vividly, the summer of 2013. It was probably the happiest summer of my life, you know? The summer before the war. I can clearly remember when we came back from our trip to Crimea. We went to Crimea, we stayed there in tents with friends. It was absolutely wonderful. We arrived back in Donetsk at the end of the summer, and it was just fantastic weather, you know? And I was walking around and thinking to myself, gosh, what a happy summer. Everything was wonderful, everything was good. And I thought, uh, I thought to myself just recently that this is what the summer before 1941 must have been like. You know, there was nothing to foreshadow war, absolutely nothing. Everything was normal, everything was wonderful. If in 2013 someone told me that there would be, well, my done, okay, disturbances happen every now and again, but that there would be such events on my done and that Russia would invade, and that I, an absolutely peaceful person, a teacher, the most peaceful of professions, if someone had told me that I would join a battalion, that I would, excuse me, hold a weapon in my hands, and all the rest of it, I never in my life would have believed this. It's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. That kind of thing just can't happen, because that kind of thing just can't happen. And I, uh, I just wanted to read that because this feeling of these things just can't happen. I feel I have so often these days of just of hearing from, from people in Ukraine and from reading the news and um, I think very much captures it so happy in her poetry that's just so so hard to comprehend that we're just going to be going on. Um, yeah, I suppose um, question of comprehension um, seems to me resonates sort of across these three texts and um, across, well, yeah, let's say across these three texts um, and, and kind of points to questions about the extent to which writing or maybe theater or maybe other forms uh, can, can help us comprehend um, and I guess uh, one of the things that we three all have in common it is work in theater, actually. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say, Alyssa, for example, that you don't feel like, although many of your the texts and your books, your book had previously been on stage, that you don't feel the impulse, or you can't imagine what that would be like now. Um, I wonder if you might say a few more words about that, or, or also, Maria, if you feel like your um, theater, you know, kind of where your theater work exists in connection to your current work at the Ukrainian Institute and elsewhere, for example. Um, like for you personally, where is theater in this? I'm thinking as we speak, and I haven't actually thought about it because I wasn't planning to, to make any theater, so it wasn't time, so I guess <laughs> I would make time if, if the 
Will was there. I suppose for me, all that remains, the sh show that I created before, or the creative of the company, before I wrote the book, was about forcing audiences to witness our recall of events. So telling uh, audiences into witnesses, witnesses of not the real thing, but of our remembering the real thing. And at the moment, I think the only thing I'm capable of is to be the witness myself, to process that through writing, and writing for no one and therefore everyone, if you see what I mean. So without having an audience in mind. Um, yeah, and I feel like, you know, when I, I read the I read the piece that you read across the day several times, I read it from the original I read it in translation. But something that struck me today listening to you is this idea that the war is in your body, it's part of your system, it's in your skin, it can be visible to others or not, and it's there forever. And I guess at the moment it's just so there that I'm not able to perform it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I also uh, don't think, don't feel that I would be the right person or that I possibly could try to find a way to articulate um, everything that's going on now. And actually, I find it totally extraordinary that Irina has managed to find the words in her poetry. Uh, and I really found it very therapeutic reading it. And there are lots more poems as well, uh, including an English translation that are available online. Um, the Epiphany uh, Journal online has and the literary hub and the young translators on for the white review uh, and uh, I, I, I think I think it's really important at the moment especially for it to be a Ukrainian voice um, to be uh, articulating these events and it, uh, I, mean, I guess it just takes time um, and it's interesting what you say about documentary theatre and whether that can be the right genre right now so quickly I mean I don't know I, like I was saying earlier it's just this we just find ourselves in a situation where stories and reality are so blurred and you don't need to fictionalize anything to have uh, the story. The stories are already there. Um, and so I, mean, I think that's where documentary theater is so powerful. And I mean, it would be great to hear more about the examples of what documentary theater, because uh, I know there's the theater of displaced people where actors have actually told their own stories since 2014 in Ukraine. And, um, and to me, it sort of instinctively, it seems like that's the only way is for real people to be able to tell their own stories on stage like that. But I, I'm, I'm interested to know why you feel that isn't the right thing right now, or that it takes time, or how can you think sci-fi might actually be better um, the genre? Um, I mean, the sci-fi theory is, you know, a work in progress. Theory, but, <laughs> um, I think because. Well, one reason is a lot of the witness theater that took place in the eight years after Maidan was about creating conditions for dialogue um, between Ukrainians from different parts of the country who might have different experiences or, um, you know, kind of bringing people together who might not otherwise be together. So that's one element of that work that's no longer relevant now in these circumstances at this moment, it seems to me. Um, however, I also, I mean, again, it's very, uh, it's very sensitive to be a person who's trying to look, to witness this witnessing and analyze it. And I, um, I guess what I can say is I can take the lead from Lisa Lili, who I'm working with on this on this research, and um, and say that the the type of trauma and the type of horror that that people are reporting back now um, is is. I mean, we read it, <laughs> and I mean, it's traumatizing just and to to admit admit it. Um, 
and I, I think, I don't know what that, what we're processing in that moment, right? Whereas I think the witness theater between, a lot of the witness theater between 2014 and 2022 was creating a space in which people could come together, potentially from different parts of the country, share those stories, take ownership of those stories, find agency through the process of telling those stories, and in that collective action, uh, kind of reclaim a, reclaim a subjectivity. Um, that's not the vulnerability in Ukraine now. <laughs> that's not what people need. That's not what theater, that's not the role that theater and art are playing in this current circumstance. And um, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why I don't see it as resonant in the same way as it used to be. Yeah. Maybe we'll open up the conversation to um, questions if anybody has anything that they want to talk about or any um, questions for the speakers. Sorry. Yeah. So all three stories that and uh, and poems that have been read, I have a personal connection to in one way or another because I come from Donetsk um, and then uh, also afterwards I went to Kiev and uh, I also experienced loss, although it wasn't because of the war. But uh, you guys uh, have talked about how um, you feel drawn to, to be the two people from England or Britain, uh, but it feels wrong to be um, you know, the ones creating something about this war. But what I'm actually interested about is how do you guys who don't have that personal uh, connection uh, to with these circumstances, how do you actually experience this? Because when the war happened, I was here. Suddenly I felt like everybody British that I knew uh, was living in a completely different world. Uh, and uh, the question of uh, how do you create this understanding of what we're going through, this connection, has been on my mind for a long time. Uh, and especially the, point, the third poem you read out, uh, Maria, uh, resonated with me because you were talking about, oh, the, that poem was talking about the grandmother who was telling the stories from the Second World War. And I remember a few years ago listening to stories of my paternal grandmother uh, fleeing um, a Jewish village in the war and um, my paternal great-grandmother being taken by uh, Germans. And feeling like that's some kind of a completely different world and I couldn't relate at all to it, even though that happened to my direct relatives. And it was explained to me in, in vivid detail. So I'm always asking this question of how do you actually get people to understand what you are going through? So I'm wondering, what, what are you, how do you guys experience this thing that's happening in Ukraine? Thank you so much for this question. Do you want to go first, Maria? Okay, well, I, I will say I should admit that I'm actually not from the UK, I'm American. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a bit of a little bit too. Full disclosure. I. I'm really, I'm really grateful for this question. Actually, um, one of the, one of the initial inspirations for organizing this um, event, which potentially may be a series of events, we'll see how it goes, um, was to include people, uh, to to make sure that it includes people from Ukraine and also people who are not from Ukraine, uh, to, to create spaces in which a London audience, an international London audience can see that there are lots of people who are connected to Ukraine in different ways, and that it isn't, that this isn't a Ukrainian war, <laughs> and that um, this is something that 
touches all of us. And I think in terms of learning to live with it, right? And that feeling of that kind of constant alienation that I did feel at the beginning, I don't feel I don't feel as often. And I now do have conversations with people where we don't, you know, people who don't aren't connected to Ukraine and it, and we don't talk about it. And that's its own kind of heartbreak. Um, uh, all of that resonates with me a lot. Uh, um, I mean, it's just this really tricky thing, and Irina refers to it in her poem about hearing the names of Aleppo and other parts of the world where there have been horrible wars, and you just forget those names and carry on brushing your teeth and get on with your day. And um, it's just so difficult. I mean, unless things really touch us personally, it's so difficult to really relate to it and to really understand. I mean, I think the best chance that we have of that is through theatre and art and literature to be able to understand what that human experience is. And so, you know, even with documentary theatre, it could be that that's a genre that might not be right for Ukrainians speaking to each other, but for Ukrainians to speak to us here, being able to convey that experience, I think, is really powerful because you have to, you know, you, and I, I think it's incredible this thing about the theatre of displaced people being keep real, but you know, on last year's book, part of the reason why it's so, so powerful is because it's so personal and as somebody that has been also living in the UK, it feels like a very familiar story as somebody in, you know, in the UK reading it in English and lots of the, um, lots of the references in the book are to like here as well, and yet it's kind of such a personal experience of, of Valencia losing um, her brother um, fighting. So I think there just always has to be some kind of personal way in. Um, but I mean, the, the dual reality thing was something that disturbed me massively, and I did feel so with the connections that I do have to Ukraine, I really just felt like the whole world was kind of ended. And um, it was so distressing. I'm sure most people in the audience, uh, or lots of you guys anyway, will have the same experience of talk, people trying to talk about something unrelated to the war, and it just felt impossible to imagine anybody could be thinking about that. Um, uh, but I, another thing that I've really felt over this time is uh, a lot of um, guilt about the fact that I thought I was really connected to Ukraine. I literally made a documentary play about the war where we traveled around the country and spoke to loads of people about their experience of war and, and felt so moved by it all. And, and yet it still felt like war happening over there and these fantastical stories that people were saying and incredible to hear what that experience was for them because it's this alien experience of war that we can't imagine trying to understand it. And, um, and this play is actually being performed again on Friday and uh, Saturday in Cambridge by the theatre company that made it originally. And for me listening to it, part of what I feel is like, oh my god, like I just didn't, even having made that play, I didn't actually take it in, I didn't really take in what it really meant for those people that I know and I'm still in touch with. And now, I, mean, I still don't know because I'm still so far away from it. Um, but let's feel a little bit step closer to understanding what this can really mean and how it can really happen to us. But I don't really know. I don't really know um, uh, how we get get through that. How we can get through to people that this can happen to you and people that are experiencing that. Aren't, aren't, you know, they're not different. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're also fighting uh, information war. We're fighting disinformation. What role does the theatre do? we've heard today in the plays and the, the readings. How does that play into that? The information battle. Um, what, how can we elevate the theatre to reach people that are getting tired of the war in the UK and might sort of know it's bad, but they're losing interest? Um, I mean, on the question of information war, I think some of the um, several projects before the full scale invasion in Ukraine were kind of built directly to address that issue. Um, and these were a lot of these projects that I mentioned before were was kind of bringing people together. So one, um, one example is a youth theater project called Class Act East West, 